Welcome to the morning service of Hebron Evangelical Church, Dowlais. Uh, this is a pre-recorded service if you're unable to come to our service in the building this morning. Uh, but we're hoping very soon to be able to live stream so you'll be able to join with us and uh, we'll be able to worship at the same time together. Uh, but we'll open this service now with prayer. Father God, be with us today as we worship. Uh, be gracious and speak to us from your word. Uh, we ask that you would give us understanding and that you would have mercy upon us. Pour out your grace, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we'll sing a hymn. It's number 182 in the white books. If you have a red book at home, it's 150. Thou art the everlasting word.
Jesus once said this. It's in Matthew chapter 11 and verses 28 to 30. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. What's his yoke? When you think of yoke, perhaps you might think about the yolk of an egg, the yellow bit inside an egg. Uh, but Jesus meant the piece of wood that used to be put on top of animals when they ploughed fields. Uh, that piece of wood would have been very heavy for the animals underneath. Now, many of us might feel like we've got lots of weights pressing down on us. And those weights are our worries. Uh, we can be worried about all kinds of things. Uh, people are worried by coronavirus that people keep talking about. So we've got the weight of that worry on us. Or you might be worried about school. Uh, so here's another weight that you've got to think about. Uh, you might be worried about what people think of you. That's something else to worry about. Or you might be worried about your sin. After a while, it all gets too much. It's all too heavy. The good news of the Bible is that the Lord Jesus Christ calls us to take our worries to him. Our worries, our yoke, is heavy. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, we're able to take all of our worries to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him. We'll read now from God's word. Uh, this morning and this evening, we're going to look at Ecclesiastes 11 through into chapter 12 and verse 8. Uh, but we're going to do that backwards. So this morning, we're going to look at chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, and then this evening, we'll come back to chapter 11. So I'll read now just from chapter 12 and verses 1 to 8. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 1 to 8. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the windows are dimmed, and the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails, because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. We'll turn to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for what it is to go to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he takes our burdens from us. We thank you especially that he takes the burden of our sin from us. We thank you for what it is to go to the Lord Jesus Christ and in him to know rest from sin. We give thanks for that hymn 
Uh, the hymn that says, uh, I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Uh, and so this morning we ask that we would know what it is for heavy yokes to be lifted from us. Uh, as we worship this morning, may, may we uh, be reminded again of your power and might. Uh, you are self-sufficient. Uh, you are infinite in all your attributes. You are all powerful and we are weak and dependent. Uh, but we thank you that through the Lord Jesus Christ, you invite us to turn to you and to find refuge in you. Uh, and you do not turn us away because you have promised to save us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so may we know what it is to look to you today. Uh, we have read in your word, uh, we just read that we are to remember our creator in the days of our youth. May we know what it is to turn to you whilst we still have life. Uh, before our final day comes, uh, may we know that all is right because we have come to know you through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, bring us to him if we do not yet know him, uh, that we may live the life that's worth living now uh, and we would also know the glorious life that is yet to come for all your people. So be with us, then we pray. Uh, wherever we are this morning, uh, speak to us. Uh, may your word come to us with the power of the Holy Spirit that we might have light and conviction and we might come to faith and repentance. We pray this morning for the leaders of our nation uh, in Wales and in the United Kingdom. Uh, we ask that you would give to them wisdom. Uh, we pray too that wisdom might be given uh, to the leaders of the church. Uh, we, we pray for our own congregation here at Hebron. Uh, and then we ask too that you would be with us as individuals and give us all that we need in this ongoing and unusual time. We pray for other churches across Wales and the United Kingdom and we ask again for the gospel to advance. Uh, we pray for your people across the world. Uh, we, we remember those um, we remember those this morning who are at risk of more than a virus, uh, those who risk their lives by following Christ. Give boldness and courage to your people, we ask. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that you reign over all things, that nothing is outside of your control. And therefore, may we give our lives to you completely and know what it is to live for your glory. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing again uh, the hymn, if you have a white book at home, is number 862. And uh, if you have a red book at home, it's number 820. When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon radiant sun? When I stand with Christ on high, looking o'er life's history, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe.
look at another long section in this book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, so this evening I want us to look at chapter 11 and this morning I want us to look at chapter 12 and the first eight verses. So if you like we're doing this a little backwards. I've mentioned before uh, a song sung by Johnny Cash called Hurt. Uh, the lyrics aren't his, it was a song written by a band called Nine Inch Nails. Uh, but this cover by Johnny Cash sounds very different to their original. Now, I'm not recommending you look it up and, and watch it, uh, but there's a video that accompanies this Johnny Cash song. And there he is, uh, clearly an old man in bad health. Uh, he died, I think, uh, about seven months after the video was made and his wife, uh, June Carter Cash, she died uh, sooner than that. The video has clear themes. It's set in the Johnny Cash Museum, but the museum is old. It's dilapidated. It's almost derelict. Uh, the point is, uh, this man, Johnny Cash, uh, like the museum once built for him, is on the way out. Uh, there's a sign on the front door that says, closed to the public. It's no longer open for business. Uh, there are platinum records on the walls uh, that are cracked. Uh, in the video, there are clips of uh, Johnny Cash looking more youthful and energetic, but then the video comes back to a man whose hands shake uh, as he lifts them. At the end of the video, the music stops uh, and Johnny Cash slowly shuts uh, the lid of the piano that he's rather been weakly uh, tapping chords out on. What's it like to grow old? Uh, well, here in verses 1 to 8 of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the preacher tells us what it's like to get old in a very poetic way. Uh, these verses, I think, describe to us what life is like at the very end. Uh, so let's begin with verse 2. Uh, so verse 2 of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened. Uh, there's something apocalyptic about those words. Uh, the imagery being used is the imagery of the end of time itself. A day is coming when the sun and the light and the moon and the stars will dissolve and will be no more. There will be an end to this universe as we know it now. Uh, well, so it is, the preacher says, there will be a day when there will be an end for you. Uh, look at how verse 2 goes on. Uh, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. Sometimes we have rain. It's only a shower. It, it might only be a shower, uh, but we've, we've watched the clouds form overhead and uh, we've seen how the clouds have got darker and darker. The temperature uh, drops a little. We sense the rain is about to fall. Uh, but then, not long after, the rain has cleared and the sun is out again. Uh, we might think of our lives in that way. Uh, perhaps we might think of our health in that way. Uh, we have times of rain, we have times of illness, we have times of, of bad health, but then we've known the clouds to clear and uh, the sun return again. Uh, our lives might be described like that. We go from sunshine to rain, from sunshine to rain. Uh, but the end of verse 2 here describes at the end of verse 2 describes uh, a time when the clouds return after the rain. Uh, the rain has come and this time there is a darkness that does not go away. In fact, it is possible for the word after here uh, to be translated as with. So it could say the clouds return with the rain. This time there is no return in sunshine. There is now only darkness and rain, and the darkness is here to stay. Uh, look at verses uh, 3 to 6. Uh, look on into verses uh, 3 to 6. Uh, here, there's imagery of a person's 
decline before death comes. I think verses 3 to 6, um, the imagery is of how a body becomes more and more frail. So verse 3 begins, look at the beginning of verse 3. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble. So the house is a person's body. The keepers of the house probably refers to what you most often use to protect your body. That is your hands. What's happening now to your hands? They tremble. They shake. Verse 3 goes on. And the strong men are bent. What are the strong men of your body? They are probably those things that keep you upright. Your legs. But what's happened to them? They're bent. Uh, They are no longer able to keep you upright and straight. Uh, Verse 3 goes on. Uh, And the grinders cease because they are few. Uh, What are the grinders of your body? They are your teeth. Uh, There are less grinders to grind than there were before. Uh, And then uh, look at the last bit of verse 3. And those who look through the windows are dimmed. Surely the eyes, uh, eyesight, becomes faint and dim. Uh, This is what happens. Uh, Hands start to shake, legs become weak, teeth become few, and eyes grow dim. Uh, Verse 4 continues. And the doors on the street are shut uh, when the grinding is low. Uh, So perhaps there, uh, the doors on the street refers to a person's ears uh, because they're shut. Uh, There are various interpretations of this imagery. Uh, Perhaps the sense of verse 4 is our hearing gets bad, so bad that we can't hear the grinding. Uh, Perhaps we can't hear ourselves chew. Or, Or perhaps the grinding refers to the grinding of grain. Uh, Every day I drive my children to school and even in this time of restrictions where people are being told to work from home, we see and hear that the world is busy. Uh, There is the sound of cars and the sounds of of lorries and trains and the noise perhaps of of a factory, the sound of a, a school bell. The world goes on. But I think perhaps the sense here is for those At the end of life, they are cut off from all of that activity. Uh, Perhaps they're confined to a house. Their door is shut and they don't hear what they used to hear. They don't hear the hustle and bustle uh, of normal life. Their hearing perhaps can no longer detect what is going on in the world outside. However, look at how verse 4 goes on. Uh, Perhaps... The frustration of age, your ears are deaf to many things, and yet sleep is disturbed by the slightest of noises. So verse 4 goes on, and one rises up at the sound of a bird. Sleep is difficult, and sleep frequently escapes you, and you rise well before the rest of the world. Look at the end of verse 4. Uh, All the daughters of song are brought low. Perhaps that's a reference again to not being able to hear well. Uh, You can't hear in order to appreciate the music you once loved. Or or perhaps it's a reference to not being able to sing yourself. Uh, Your lack of hearing impedes your own ability to sing. Or perhaps it's simply that now your vocal cords have become weak. Uh, Either way, you are deprived of music. Uh, Look on into verse 5. There's more in verse 5. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. Uh, With age there comes a fear of heights and a fear of falling. Uh, Also the almond tree blossoms. Our hair turns white and grey. The grasshopper drags itself along. So the person who could once jump high struggles now to lift their feet from the floor. Also, desire fails. Motivation and appetite seem to fade away. All of these things happen because the person being described here is um, 
is like the museum of Johnny Cash. The person is in the process of closing for business. Uh, verse 5 closes with this. Because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. A death is coming. Uh, there is an eternal home ahead of us. In other words, the place we're going to, it's a, an eternal home. It's a one-way ticket. It's the place of death, the place to which we will always belong. There's no coming back. Uh, the mourners who mourn your departure will only witness your departure. They will not see you return. Look on into verse 6. Uh, here are images of the final act of death itself. So the first half of verse 6. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken. It's a picture that says, yes, life is precious. Uh, life is like a silver cord or a golden bowl. A life isn't cheap. Um, it's a silver cord, a golden bowl, not cheap, not inconsequential. Every human life has dignity because, as we've said before uh, from Genesis, we know that every man and woman is someone created in the image and in the likeness of God. And yet, although life is precious, uh, like a silver cord or a golden bowl, a time comes when, look at the picture again, uh, the silver cord snaps and the golden bowl breaks. Uh, and so too, every life one day will end. Uh, like a golden bowl smashing into thousands of, of little pieces, making it beyond repair. Uh, there's a programme on the BBC that's become very popular, I think, uh, with many people. It's called The Repair Shop. Uh, so, so much stuff gets thrown away, but there's this team of incredibly skilled people who know how to restore so many things that appear to be ruined and spoiled. Uh, but the, the image here in verse 6, out of things beyond repair, the golden bowl will never be a bowl, golden bowl again. Uh, because the silver, the silver cord holding it up has snapped and the golden bowl is smashed. Uh, in the second half of verse 6, uh, there's another image. Uh, we read, uh, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. The picture is perhaps of a pitcher uh, being lowered down a well. Uh, being lowered down a well by a rope, a rope that runs around a wheel. But the wheel breaks and the pitcher smashes. And then we come to verses 7 and 8. Uh, so firstly, uh, verse 7, uh, we read, And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Uh, back in Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis 2 verse 7, we read of how the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. So man is from the dust, and God gave life by breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. Well, we have here now, we read of a man returning to the dust. He is no longer sustained by the breath of life that came from God. And so it is, we move into verse 8 and we come to that word that we've come across so many times as we've gone through this book, we come across this word vanity for the last time. Verse 8, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. It's that Hebrew word hevel again. Life is a mere breath. And so because life is a mere breath, it means can we prevent that final moment of death coming? Is that final moment of death a long way off? No, it is not. Because all of life seems to sweep by like a breath. Uh, and you can't prevent this final moment of death that's been described. You can't prevent it because life is a breath or as it could be translated as well, life is a vapour. You can't grasp it. That is, you can't control it. And because you can't control it, you can't prevent 
your last breath from coming. Now notice as we worked through these verses, how many times the word before is mentioned. Um, so we saw it at the beginning of verse 6. So verse 6, before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. And then it's also at the beginning of verse 2. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after rain. So before all of that, before the final moments of death, as they're described in these verses, before all of that, do something. Do what? We'll go back to the beginning of the chapter. Uh, go back to verse 1. There in verse 1 of chapter 12, remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before, so there's that word again, before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before your final moments, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Now sometimes, uh, this is a verse we give to children or to teenagers, or to students, or perhaps to people under the age of 30. What is it to be young? Well, I think from the structure of these verses, your youth here simply means before the silver cord is snapped, any time before the golden bowl is broken, before that happens, remember your Creator. Now, what does that mean? Well, this evening we'll look at the detail of what it means to remember your Creator as we go back into, into chapter 11. But this morning, let's just note this about the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is very real. It's told us again and again, in no uncertain terms, that death is coming to every one of us. It's told us that our lives and our impact will largely be forgotten by those who come after us. But we've seen again and again the preacher does not lead us in the direction of depression and despair. And so we'll, we'll look at this tonight, uh, but look back into chapter 11 and uh, you'll see once again commands to be joyful. The beginning of verse 8, so if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. The beginning of verse 9, rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. If you're not yet dead and you're not in the final throes of death, continue to live life joyfully. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes tells us when we when we live life in the light of death, we can do it joyfully. Knowing that death is certain is to shape the way you live life. Live life by remembering your creator. Uh, notice here that the preacher describes God as his creator. I read this week an account of a man's journey to faith in Christ. And uh, he described a turning point in his life. Uh, he returned home one night to find that there had been a power cut. His house was in darkness and so uh, he sat down on the settee and his dog was next to him. And he noticed that there was a difference between him and his dog. His dog accepted the darkness. Uh, his dog sat there in the dark. Now this man had been reading the book of Genesis. And he realised he had an awareness that light was good. Uh, he was in a power cut and he wanted light because light was good. And as I said, he'd been reading the book of Genesis. He remembered that when God said, let there be light and there was light, God saw that the light was good. He, he started to understand it must be that I am a creature made in the image of God because 
I think, as my creator does. He also remembered that God, as creator, created man in his image and likeness. His, his pet dog sat there, but he, unlike the dog, was beginning to get creative. As one made in the image of a creator, he was scrounging around and seeking to create light. Now, where are the matches? Where's the torch? He also considered, being in the middle of a power cut, of how he had learnt about light in school. He'd learnt about the generation of electricity, and he learnt about it because his teachers said things. They spoke, and he listened. And then he remembered again Genesis 1, God said, let there be light. And whilst he could communicate with words, his dog just sat there. Now that's just one man's account of how the Bible began to make sense to him. A realisation that he was different to his dog. Only men and women in Genesis are said to be made in the image and likeness of God. He was, he was creative like his creator. Like his creator, he knew that light was good. Like his creator, he spoke. Now that was his experience as he went home to a dark house in the middle of a power cut with, with only his dog for company. But perhaps you are having your own experience, you are beginning to understand that as human beings we are unique and we were made to know our Creator. The preacher here in Ecclesiastes tells us to remember our Creator. When in the days of your youth, what does that mean before the final throes of death come upon you. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. And so the knowledge of death approaching, instead of leading us to depression and despair, it should instead shape our lives to be lives that remember our Creator. We were made to know God. And the Bible tells us very clearly there is only one way to know God. It is through Jesus Christ. Now, the message of the Bible is this. Our sin has cut us off from God. But this is the good news. The barrier of our sin can be removed. Because God in his mercy sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to take it from us. If we trust in him. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ pays the price for our sin upon the cross if we trust in him. And then it means this, the barrier for our sin is removed and the way is opened for us to know God. And we can walk with him and talk with him and we can hear his words to us through the Bible. The way is opened up for us if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, it means when we pray, he hears. When we read, he speaks. And his word, as we hear it, means we know his will. We know how he wants us to live. And how he wants us to live lives that are good and that please him. And live lives which are the only kind that will bring pleasure to him but also joy to us. True and real joy through knowing the Creator. Do you know Him? You can know Him through faith in Jesus Christ. Death is coming, yes. And so for that reason, remember now your Creator and come to know the God who made you both now in this life and also in the life to come. Well, we'll sing a hymn again. If you have a white book, it's number 504. If you have a red book, it's number 501. Uh, 504 then. Sovereign grace or sin abound in ransomed souls, the tidings swell.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.